The world is changing by leaps and bounds, and we don't know what will happen in the future. We have many uncertainties, and to learn about this, we have now the presentation of Jorge Arevalo, Vice Minister of Vocational Education and Training of the Basque Government. Damos paso a Jorge Arevalo, Viceconsejero de Formación Profesional del Gobierno Vasco. It's a fourth industrial revolution. It's a fusion of the physical, the digital, and the biological world. It's changing not only what we are doing, it's changing who we are. It's really the notion of digital technology pervasively impacting every walk of life in every vertical industry on all parts of the globe. Whether it's information technology and the acceleration we see in artificial intelligence, a lot is happening. Society and how we're going to live is being defined right now. The speed is mind-boggling. What I particularly concerned about is how little the world is prepared. Harnessing this revolution requires the involvement of all stakeholders, from public and private sectors to academia and civil society. The World Economic Forum Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Network ensures that the development and application of emerging technologies benefits both people and the planet. It is a network of centers for scalable impact, with locations in the United States, Japan, India and China, bringing together stakeholders to identify the impacts of these technologies, co-design innovative governance protocols and policy frameworks, and pilot them with partners around the world. If we are not innovative, if we're not creative enough, it would be very difficult to survive in this century. Humans and machines are assisting each other, augmenting each other with skills. Humanity itself will be changed with this super intelligence, and we are at the doorstep of that era. The technologies available today will impact and change healthcare forever. 52% of the encounters with our primary care physicians were handled virtually. Just a massive of change. The network will work closely to share research, analysis and learning, and help design new technologies in ways that respect societal values. It's where innovation is happening, about how we guide this revolution. We can solve the many the social issues through the digital technologies. My hope is that we have a robust discussion for how this can truly help our world solve some of the hard-pressed challenges that we have today. Together, we can shape a future that truly benefits and empowers people. The world has changed. We can never, ever go back to yesterday. The best question that we could ask ourselves, having just seen what we've just seen in this video, is how are we going to respond to the changes that we're already seeing in some cases and the many changes that we'll be seeing in upcoming years? Because we're heading towards a different world. We're going to be work living in a new reality, a new reality in which technologies are going to be merged into th three worlds which will also merge the physical, digital and biological worlds. We're going to experience this new reality knowing as the last person on the video said that we can never go back to yesterday, never. We need to work and look forwards. We need to move towards the future to this new era of humanity, as Joachim Bilderatz, our regional minister for education, said. Because if what we do is just look into the past, then the past is, just becomes a black hole, a black hole that absorbs us, that sucks us in and that destroys us. So we need to look forward, and that's what we're trying to do. And that's what we'll be seeing in the next uh, speeches during this Congress. It's true that we've been through an appalling pandemic. Many people have died. They've been, that's affected the economy. It's affected logistics. And it's uh, created many emotional, mental problems in our population. And this has forced us to focus on what is urgent, but from a defensive 
position. It's also true that the empire of immediacy has seems to have started. Everything needs to be now. Uh, we already knew two minutes after it happened when there'd been some new contagion in Germany, for example. We knew everything in record speed. And life is very speedy. And it seems that is forcing us to be immediate and everything. Everything needs to be now. And it would seem that everything happens at the same time in all places. And actually, that's not true. And yet we're seeing with the progress that we've seen of this fourth industrial revolution that is, of course, very swift. We've realized that actually we need time to reflect Sufficient time, not too much. We don't need to spend too much time reflecting, but we do need to reflect. We need to think about where we should be heading, how we're going to respond to all the challenges that are ahead of us. That, and there are many of them, and they're very, very important. One thing we have learned is that those crises that overlap each other, and we've been in a crisis, for example, for the last 14 years since Lehman Brothers went back to bankrupt in 2008, and now 2022, with several wars, and the most recent one, the invasion of Russia in Ukraine, through all of these uh, crises, we know that there's a huge coefficient of unpredictability. And this coefficient of unpredictability uh, forces us to De develop even further our ability to anticipate. An ability to anticipate which is mainly based on three elements which we as people need to have. If you look at them, people say, oh, just leave me alone. I want to go off on holiday. I'm sick of this. There'll be somebody to solve this problem. The politicians are there. We pay them to solve these problems. Okay, you know, that's true. We're like that. But we do have a responsibility, but we also need to be able to get people to observe what's happening, to understand what's happening and to learn from what's happening because we need to go together if we're going to develop a common future. And if we do that well, it's going to be a promising future. If we do it badly, I'd rather not to think about it. That's what we're doing now, but we need to observe comprehend and, un and learn. And that's something very important because we're at a time which is perhaps the most complex and the most in interesting for humankind. We're working in a world which is already uh, automated and will be increasingly automated with robotics. It's a cognitive world within uh, artificial intelligence, cognitive intelligence with immediate access to data in any country around the world and where everything is connected to everything else. Now what we find is that we're experiencing uns the uncertainty of moving towards what's unthinkable, because actually we don't know what the future holds for us. This future that we're awaiting, that we're building now with everything that we've seen, is taking us towards something that's actually unthinkable, towards a new era of humankind, towards a new shape of uh, the human who needs to be the star of the future. But let's just have a thought about the Internet of Things. You might have heard of that, the Internet of Machines, the Internet of everything. But actually now people are working on the Internet of Feelings. Our sensory organs are going to be able in the future to control our surroundings. We haven't reached there yet. It's not going to happen before 2030. But now, as you can see on the screen, we're already working on brain waves. And we're working on sight. These are vocational education and training processes. And with the sight, they can make a drone fly. This gentleman looks at a screen. He has a device on his head which transmits the frequency uh, to a domotic a device that uh, makes this drone uh, fly or that can make the blinds uh, go up or go down, as you can see, or turn the telly off, if that's what we want to do. This is done by sight and with transmission of brain waves. We're already working on that now. 
And so we're heading towards what's going to happen before 2030, which is the Internet of Feelings, of Senses. Because what is it we're trying to attain at the end of the day? We want greater progresses in our society. That's our ultimate goal, to progress. We want greater social welfare. And this progress, which is really, really important, is actually not guaranteed. It's not a right. It is true that we shouldn't renounce it. We should be unwavering in trying to achieve progress, but it's not a right. And it's only progress if we all progress together. Social cohesion, this is key. And a progress that needs a specific and well-defined strategy. That's why we need time for reflection, because reflection is going to help us anticipate to progress towards this progress with all the changes that are ahead of us and the transformations that we need to go through. Our regional minister said that we're heading towards a... 5.0 society. That's right. This was something that was created, this uh, expression, in Japan in 2018. It's uh, uh, the new society 5.0 is once we've fully developed the new fourth uh, industrial revolution. It's based on three key elements. Firstly, smart economy and society. Secondly, sustainable economy and society. And thirdly, an inclusive economy and society. Smart uh, education is needed for training. And when we talk about sustainability, we've got a huge challenge ahead of us. And it's a long-term challenge. And it's going to help us with the problems that the planet has today currently will be solved if we're lucky in the long term and in the short and medium time we're going to have to suffer and we need to palliate as much as possible so that those effects that we suffer are as small as possible until we are able to solve the planet's environmental problem and the inclusive uh, side of things and that's really important because we feel that social cohesion is important either we all progress together or we don't progress we know that we're going to have to face continuous changes that require us to anticipate. And there's going to be a great deal of volatility, complexity and ambiguity because we're working on something which is unknown. We sometimes progress via pure intuition because actually we don't know what's going to be around the corner. But we do know that we want to create a new value chain in society, a better society, a better prepared society that lives better. That's our goal. And and we think it's an important goal. And for that, we need a new way of understanding the future that we're talking about. But anticipating the future isn't actually improving what we already have. And it's not just advancing. It's not just improving uh, what we already have, but it's advancing to what will be in the future, what is going to happen in the future, with all those risks that are involved. And they're out there, but we need to do that if we want to anticipate. And that's what we're already doing in VET in the Basque Country. In VET in the Basque Country, we're working in three areas of, at the same time. Present uh, environments, that is what we need now. What are... Uh, People need to work, what our companies need to be competitive now. We work also on emerging environments that are developing on changes that are happening and um, thanks to the fourth industrial revolution and we're working on 16 different emerging sectors but also unknown sectors. We're working on something which actually we don't know what it is or what it's going to be. And this means that we're also working in the big data of change. We are entering many, many data that are helping us to envisage, to foresee, to predict what might happen in the future. We're working with an observatory which will be up and running uh, soon and in 2025 and 2030. And just a few weeks ago, the Basque government set up the Basque Centre for Future Learnings, which is going to be working three years ahead, preparing for when we need to have a prepared uh, people they are prepared for what's happening in the future but we are clear in the Basque country that when everything changes there are still two basic things that are key firstly our 
ethical values, our profound ethical values within vocational education training, and secondly, lifelong learning. And in that sense, VET has a key role, as you all know, in developing society. Because at the end of the day, the main goal that we want is sustainable human development, because people need to live for many years. They need to be prepared to live for many years without too many ups and downs, at least so that they can uh, carry on working with as least uh, problems as possible. It's a different world of work, what's uh, just around the corner. Employment is going to require us to be far more professional, different kind of professional. We're going to have to develop people more intellectually because there are going to be lots of machines, lots of robots that are going to replace repetitive work. So our people need to increase their training, their skills, and be more intellectual in their approach. This is really, really important because everything that uh, can't be automated is going to be very, very valuable because what's repetitive is going to gradually disappear from people's, from humans' works. It's going to be passed into the hands of robots. So that's where we need to insist because we know that we need to prepare people for disruptive changes because things are going to happen that have never happened in the whole of the history of uh, humankind so we need to look towards where we're going to find out what we need to do that requires people to learn and to get used to working with robots with automatic machines with automatisms and with smart systems in a vet what we've got as our backbone is what we call strategic innovation innovation is like a spiral it's continually moving, it's continually changing, it can't stop, otherwise it wouldn't be innovation by definition. And we need to be prepared with this innovation to actually transform things and situations as is needed. This means that innovation, which is value-based, and this is really important for us because these are profound values, it needs to be supported by three pillars that actually was were mentioned by our regional minister technology knowledge and collaboration these are three key elements and i'm going to start by talking about knowledge because actually i think it's the most important one and that what we're most concerned about knowledge which is in its turn based on three elements information learning and communication information isn't knowledge information is information raw information. Information becomes knowledge when it's applied. I've got information and with that information I do something. When I do something it becomes knowledge but it also becomes learning and then we need to be able to communicate. Many things uh, fail because we don't communicate properly so we need information, learning and communication are the three we feel key elements in the uh, field of what we call knowledge and they're related to a further three vital things uh, sorry two vital things which are talent and creativity and it may well be in the area of talent where we've been reflecting most in uh, the teams that we work with in what we call high performance training and learning because how can we get those people that are studying VET how can we get them to have a talent, a special talent? How can we get them to stand out, to have them to be best prepared? These are skilled, uh, talented professionals. How can we get them to be talented? So are we offering learning or training? It's not actually the same thing. It's not the same to be well-trained to do things as to be well-trained to know how. Of course we get trained, but with that, we move on to learning and there dual training has a key role to play. I get trained, I learn and I develop what I have to do so I know how to do things. This is really key. So we're talking here about training and learning, not training or learning. They complement each other. And, and when we talk about talent and we use active methodologies, we use collaborative uh, learning that's challenge based the peop the people that are the students that are in VET have to overcome challenges in their learning what we need is for our students to develop five skills they have uh, five components to them these skills a cultural component they need to know what's happening where they live what's happening in their surroundings there is general knowledge you could even call it cultural knowledge of course they need scientific skills they need to know the the 
why and the wherefore of things. They, of course, need a technological component to everything that they do. They're going to be using more and more technology in their learning process and in their post subsequent work process. They need occupational uh, learning. And there's also the personal side of things. And the personal side of things are the values that that person has as a human being. Because those are going to what puts us above robots. That's the, the values of humans in the future. And also we work on cross-cutting skills. I've just put seven up on the screen, but there are 25 of them, actually. And please allow me to just uh, read them. Uh, complex problem solving, uncertain scenario planning, collaborative communication, cognitive flexibility, focused learning, stress management, integration of robotic environments, right up to the 25, that's just seven of them. We're working on the 26th as well. This is really important because these students need to be prepared for the future. What's more, we include two things in this uh, learning process which are very important. Learning, thinking and intelligence. So we've got critical and creative uh, a thought. I can say that something's not right but I can propose something to improve it and I can propose something that nobody else has proposed and that makes me different. But what's more, we work on three kinds of intelligence, emotional intelligence, generative intelligence, and executive intelligence. These are three key intelligences because it's actually intelligence which is going to allow us to work on permanent transformation. That's why intelligence needs to be developed because sometimes what we do is automatic we're we're not conscious we're not aware of what we actually uh, do i'm just going to ask you a very quick question here have you been to paris have you 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 answered immediately yes or no it's a, an immediate reaction if you said yes you might have actually thought of something that you did when you're in paris a nice dinner uh, by the seine a nice uh, walk around uh, the seine and many things may have come to mind immediately if we do this with a computer, I have to program into all the different uh, journeys that I've uh, covered and I have to ask the computer, oh, where was I? Oh, have I been in Paris? Yes. Where was I happy in Paris? Oh, well, when, you were ha when you were having dinner by the Seine. But we can react automatically. We don't know if our brain works as a computer, but we do know that we can train our brains. Our brains can be trained to be quick and to take quick, efficient decisions as well. How can we do that? Just with a, I can give you a practical example, which can be used for anything in any life. I used a work before and I'm now going to use tennis. I, I put uh, the ball up in the air. I'm looking at how my opponent hits the ball. Where the ball's coming from? I'm just sending orders to my muscles so I know where to run. I know where to put my tennis racket and all that in half a millisecond. Half a millisecond. For any sport and any activity, it's always the same. How do we do that as humans? Well, in, uh, with our students, we know that we've got innate abilities, innate skills. Don't ever forget that we all have a, a bit of genius in us that makes us incredible, that makes us intelligent. We need to use the genius of each and every student and skill it. We need to train it. So there are innate skills. You need a project, a specific uh, development, and you need training, lots and lots of training. And all of that, we've already spoken about knowledge, technology and collaboration. It all needs to be done in collaborative networks. So why do I say collaborative networks? And in VET, all uh, the schools work in different collaborative networks. And in these uh, challenge-based learning uh, these students all work together, they're always developing, because of the, uh, when we share and collaborate, we can all learn. And this is something that's really important because we get that knowledge across and we strengthen each other to improve and to get better levels of knowledge. And what this means is that if you've got a group of people, you've got a group of people working on a project, that doesn't mean that you've got a team. That doesn't make a team because a group is a group of people that just uh, create a sum of their elements, but actually a team uh, generates and multiplies. And we see that in what we call our high performance spaces. These are classrooms 
I'm hoping that, oh, there you can see them now. On the screen, there you can see people working as teams, in teams, um, where they have to uh, overcome a challenge. First of all, they need to get information. They get that information, they can get it alone or in a team, as a group, what they do is get information first. Then their team analyz analyzes that information as a group, as a team. And the third thing that they do is, okay, this information that I've got and I've analyzed, can I um, make it different? Can I provide a different alternative? Can I improve upon it? The fourth step is to prepare a prototype. And that's when executive intelligence comes into play. A prototype is made. Can you see that? They correct what's not right. And the next thing they do is develop a project. These uh, classrooms that you've seen already exist. They they are equipped to, to work in this way. They've, always, they've got all the technologies so that these prototypes that are, are so important uh, for high what we call high performance learning. I've spoken about the future and I've spoken about progress, but there's something else that's important, which is attitude. We know that uh, professional skills have six elements. Uh, knowledge, capacity, skills, attitude, and aptitude. Attitude is important because we always find that when we have to transform something, we have to change something, when you've got to try to convince somebody, we always find there's somebody who says, no, that can't be done, oh, come on, forget it, it's impossible. And you have to say, no, 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 it's necessary, open your mind. And they say, no, 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 no. You know, look, your mind is like a parachute. Either you open it or it won't work. Well, they don't open their parachute just in case these people. And what happens is you find these uh, people that say, well, that's just the way I am. And some people say, oh, I'm not going to change. This may well happen. Um, we say, oh, no, oh, goodness me, how co that happens with our students. That happens with student and VET. How come that happens? Well, what they are are not weapons of mass destruction, but souls of passive destruction. That's what they are. They're souls of passive destruction. We need to fight against that. We need to carry on despite these uh, souls of passive destruction and try to convince them. Why? Because we need via intelligence to find possibilities. That's really important. And intelligence allows us to do that, find new possibilities. We need to create possibilities in this future that we're now developing today. We're writing the future that we're going to live today. And I'm hoping that for many years, for all of you, but all of the youngsters that depend on us are also doing that. We're writing the future now. You don't write the future afterwards, you write the future now and then you live it afterwards. And we need to create possibilities and that's what generative intelligence does. That's why we attach so much importance to learning. That's what we're trying to do in vocational education and training. That's what we're trying to do that. That's what we need to do if our students are gonna be prepared for the future. because. A person, what they are, is not just what they are, but the set of their possibilities. And we try to, try to um, poke all of those possibilities so that they generate for the future. We've spoken about knowledge, collaboration and technology. If I start talking about technology, of course I've got to talk about the digital transformation, smart systems. Uh, it's inevitable. And this uh, requires a great mental leap forward, first of all, because these are disruptive changes that are going to bring about a digital change, disruptive changes. So we need to evolve our minds. It's a radical process of change. And in our case, it's a global transformation. We're transforming digitally all the Basque education system. And inside the Basque education system, vocational education training, which is what my job is, all of vocational education and training, all of it, as a system. Why? Because we're heading for a new reality. We know that and we need to be prepared for it. That's key. How do we do that? By getting involved in an anticipation strategy, supporting ourselves with strategic innovation, driving forward applied intelligence and working with a smart technologies and smart systems to create a new kind of school. These smart VET schools or colleges that are different kinds of VET colleges. And the way we train our teachers has to be 
different because they are priority with our students for the system to work. We need well qualified teachers to prepare uh, our students. These uh, colleges are working on digital transformation. They work with advanced technology and they innovate in different spaces as you'll be able to see in a minute. We've defined digital spaces. What sort of digital spaces do we need? We've defined what smart systems those uh, digital spaces are going to have. We've also defined what digital training our teaching staff need. Thousands of teaching staff are being trained in digital training because we need them to be digital experts. What's more, we're working on cyber security. But we've also defined what processes can be digitized in VET and what digital tools are going to be used. Each college, each of these smarter VET colleges, um, there'll be 70 uh, in a short space of time. There are currently 26 and uh, next year there'll be more. Uh, and I think the next couple of years, 48 until we reach 70. These uh, colleges already have uh, digital transformation teams working in them. There we have digital drivers, digital spearheads, digital energizers, we call them, so that this digital transformation happens in that college. And then we all work together, all our VET colleges and all the other colleges and schools in the education system to bring about the digital transformation for the whole of the education system. We work with advanced technologies. This is a smart workshop. It's in Bergara, actually. All those machines are connected, uh, as you see, a student may appear or a teacher uh, signs in and tells them which machine they're going to work with. We work with CNC machines and also more normal machines, uh, learning machines, as you, you'll see, teaching machines. And there we know who's working on what machine, what each of those uh, people are doing. The lecturer can see that on a mobile phone or on a tablet. All the machines are connected. These are conventional lathes and think that they've all got monitors. They're all digitized so that they can learn, even with just uh, simple machines, what a smart workshop is. This is a smart work warehouse. Here, this lady's come in to get a tool she picks the tool that she needs from the workshop in the machine manufacturing uh, warehouses we've got over 2000 different parts that, and tools that you need uh, she's taken the bits and bobs that she needs the parts that she needs uh, she leaves she tells us who she is and we know who's got those parts at all times and where they are that's what we call a smart warehouse and of course this is linked in this case as you can see from the video to the workshop of course as our machines are digitized and they're working with the cloud or, and we've got smart storage we need to keep a close eye on cybersecurity this is a cybersecurity lab there you can see, I don't know if you can see, 40,150. What are those 40,150? Those are the attacks that a computer is receiving per minute, every minute. So there you can see who's attacking us. Because in the world there are 100 uh, computers that are connected. We've got one. And these 100 computers uh, are left open to attacks. Do you know how many attacks we receive per day in 100 computers around the world? Over 44 million per day in 100 computers around the world in vocational education training schools. Uh, they've got 1,400 computers in the vocational education training schools in our country, in the Basque countries. Imagine the attacks that they could be exposed to. We've also got cyber range. Cyber range is helping us to learn how to protect our computers. This is what we call additive manufacturing. Here, what we're working is with different materials. This is a machine that works without oxygen. And that can work with high added value materials. This is really important, such as titanium. Or here, this is a robot. And a plasma machine to develop additive metallic manufacturing. This is also additive manufacturing for different component parts for health 
the health industry here. We uh, collaborate with hospitals to create different organs. I don't know if you saw pancreas there with a tumour. That's the black blob on the pancreas. We also work with hospitals or on specific parts. This is, you can see a monitor and a scanner that is scanning to be able to manufacture something with a 3D printer and using a different kind of materials. These scanners scan parts or uh, parts of the human bodies, in this case, this is a real, this is a tumor of a person who was going to be operated on. But before he was operated on, the scan uh, printed out all his ribs and doctors were able to prepare titanium ribs before the operation. So we were able to reduce the operation by two hours. So we're also working in bioprinting. What is bioprinting? Well, here what we're using is human cells to print tissues, organs, organs, and as they're created using human cells, it will just be a matter of just inserting the organ. There will be no rejection from the human body. We're also working here on skin, more specifically, and we've also started working on ears. This is AI applied to training. Here you can see uh, uh, people's expressions and their uh, bodily movements because you know through people's expressions and their bodily movements whether the student is paying attention or is just off with the fairies in class. So we're seeing whether this can be applied afterwards in our classroom. We also work with collaborative robots uh, which uh, do increasingly incredible things and you need to be able to learn to work with them. We're uh, training them to see what work we can do with them. With this robot who can follow you in this case and talk to you, maybe there'll be robots that can look after the elderly, people that are lonely. We know that we can use them for that. We're researching into what we can do. In massive technologies, this is where we work with students on what is now called Industry 5.0, but which can also work, for example, on people who are dependent. We're working in a different environment. Some people call this the metaverse. These are students, and this is a, a wind turbine. They're inside that wind turbine. I don't know if you realize that. They are inside that wind turbine. And when they look downwards, they can see there's a 50 meters dr drop, and they feel vertigo just as if they were in a wind turbine. And they're working, and they're geolocated on the ceiling. Or here, where they're seeing uh, how to assemble a car. They can touch the car. They can see each other. And they can see that they're in a class. You can see they're in a classroom, by the way. Just so you know, but what they're what you're seeing there are their avatars, and their avatars can interact uh, with each other. They're assembling the car. You'll also see how we can work with other kinds of cars. This is a, a bit more of an advanced application. You can change the color of the vehicle, take the doors off. We can also work in operating theatres. Before going to the operating theatre, the student will uh, move within the operating theatre, uh, moving the instrument trays around and doing what they need to do. So this immersive reality is taking us to this incredible uh, advances in digitalization. These are 100% digital learning space is what you can see now. Here, what students do is uh, develop uh, challenges. They're, it's team-based. There are four people per table, and each uh, team of four works on its table. Then they'll send that information off to another table or another team or another uh, wall, and we can connect this table mm, to another classroom or another classroom in another uh, college. You can work in different colleges at the same time with your own tables. This is incredible progress in learning because students in VET need to be able to 100% operate digitally. And here you can see the connectivity between teamwork, between a table and the five uh, teams, five different colleges, all of which are dealing with the same challenge. This can be three or four digital walls. Usually there are four digital walls. We have in a classroom. And here, as you can see, that takes us to 
work on learning in a completely different environment, a completely different advanced context. And this is going to make it possible to connect up with the classrooms in other countries. This is digital, I can just point like that and I can send off my table to Sydney if I want to. That's not a problem. That's the approach that we're taking for the future. And in fact, 48 colleges are going to have 70 of these kind of spaces to uh, practice on this development. And they're going to be 45 immersive technology spaces that you saw earlier. So we're already living in a different kind of world, clearly different kind of world. But we shouldn't be frightened. We can't look backwards. We can't return to yesterday, as we said earlier. Let's look forward, therefore. My regional minister said it on many occasions. Off you go, Jorge. Always go forward. Always move forward. That's what we're doing. We're moving forward. But when we move forward, we need to understand that we also need to live. Because living in a hurry isn't living, it's surviving. And all of this thing related to media C, of course we need to work on anticipation, but we also need to live, but we also need to, we also need to live life. Life is very, very important for all of us. And when we have to decide, we shouldn't d decide based on our fears, because that's what's going to stop us. We need to base what we do on the beautiful words of uh, Nelson Man Mandela, who said, may your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. We shouldn't c uh, confuse hope with optimism. Optimism is uh, this uh, idea that everything is going to be fine. And yet, when you talk about hope, what hope is going to tell us is what you're doing has meaning, whatever the result may be. And it's thanks to the work of thousands of teachers in Basque VET. It's thanks to hundreds of people that lead the teams at these VT colleges, we've actually also managed to get good results because what we have seen is that really what we're doing is meaningful. And whilst we carry on working in that way, if you carry on supporting us, I feel that we are going to have a brilliant future and we are going to find the responses to the future because it is true that one day we're all going to die. But that's true. But on all the other days, we will be living. So there's still a lot to be done while we're alive. A lot to be done because it's never too late. Time only ends when life ends. There's possibility for everything. When we apply passion, emotion and commitment to vocational education and training, when we know there are thousands and thousands of people that are trusting us, trusting you to live better, to work better, to move forward, families that trust us to get their sons and daughters to have a more promising future when we know that when we're in a classroom we're not just getting across training we're getting across a part of us what we're about and what's more we get across training so that those students can earn and it's this part this passion this emotion that we put into everything that we do and what is that at the end of the day it's our hearts that's what we do in Basque VET. We work from the heart. Because it's true, technology is going to help us progress and it will help us uh, be above and beyond the rest. But it's our hearts, the heart that we put into our work that's going to allow us to go further. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to Jokin as well. I wish you all the very best. And do live. It's worth it. Thank you.